the widespread use of chemicals is an integral part of our industrial society. Regardless of the precautions taken, however, spills of these chemicals can and do occur. In certain instances, these chemical spills are hazardous to the environment. Over time, spilled chemicals can migrate through the soil down to the water table where they contaminate the groundwater. To prevent groundwater contamination, it is necessary to promptly clean up or remediate these spill sites. There are many technologies that can be used for site remediation. One common method of cleanup is to physically remove the contaminated soil and dispose of it in a hazardous waste landfill. This approach, however, is expensive, uses valuable landfill space, and is not practical for many types of contamination problems. Another concern is that all too often, chemicals later leak from the landfill, continuing the environmental and legal problems. One promising alternative for cleaning up sites is the use of a natural process termed bioremediation. This videotape program is an introduction to the technology of in-situ or on-site bioremediation. In this program, we will explore the basic concepts behind bioremediation, how site characteristics impact its effectiveness, and the current state of bioremediation technology. This method has the potential to degrade chemical contaminants at a reasonable cost and without soil excavation. In order to begin our understanding of this technology, we need to define two similar yet different terms, biodegradation and bioremediation. Uh, the distinction between biodegradation and bioremediation is important. Uh, biodegradation refers to the ability of a microbe to degrade a particular compound, to actually live and grow on that compound and convert it to its metabolic products. Um, bioremediation refers to managing the environment to enhance biodegradation so that you might, in an engineered sense, modify the environment or add particular components to stimulate the microbe's ability to grow and biodegrade that compound. It is important to recognize that the term bioremediation is often used to describe any biodegradation-based process. In the scope of this program, we will confine our focus to what is properly termed in situ bioremediation. That is, scientifically managing the biodegradation reaction occurring in the ground without removal of the contaminated soil. In situ bioremediation is using the organisms that are in place in the ground, the natural organisms. There are on the order of a million organisms per gram of aquifer material, naturally occurring organisms in the subsurface in non-contaminated sites. So there's a large population of indigenous organisms already there. And you just have to induce the ones that are capable of degrading the pollutant. While we can create laboratory conditions favorable for the biodegradation of many pollutants, it is not always possible to recreate these conditions in the field. For only when field conditions are favorable can the application of bioremediation be effective. So to evaluate whether or not bioremediation is possible, an understanding of the requirements for biodegradation is necessary. Specifically, there are four important components necessary for bioremediation to be effective in the field. First, there must be an adequate number of organisms with a metabolic capability to degrade the particular chemical pollutant. Second, the organism must have physical access to the chemical pollutant. Third, there needs to be another chemical known as an electron acceptor or donor which enables the metabolic capability of the organism. And the fourth component is that the environment must be habitable for the organism. This means that it must not be too toxic to the organism and that other conditions such as adequate nutrient levels must be met. Let's examine each of these four requirements more closely. The first point that's important to bioremediation is that you must have microbes with the appropriate number and capability to metabolize the chemical. The capability refers to the organism's enzymatic capacity 
to attack a particular chemical. And these are specific for particular chemicals. In other words, one organism may metabolize one type of chemical, but that does not mean that it can metabolize another class of chemicals. There is specificity between organism and chemical. In other words, for bioremediation to proceed at a reasonable rate, we must have enough of the right kind of organisms. Since populations of organisms can adapt to local conditions, we often find microbes already present at a site that can degrade the pollutant. This degradation occurs simply because the pollutant is available as a source of food for the organisms. Um, the second point that's important in bioremediation is the accessibility of the chemical to the organism. In the natural setting, many of these chemicals are not very water-soluble, or they are absorbed to mineral surfaces in soil. And they may not reach the organism because the organism basically lives in a water phase. And so the bioremediation may be limited by the inaccessibility of the organism to the particular chemical. Normally, the organism gains access to the chemical when it dissolves or desorbs into water and the water comes in contact with the cell wall. Therefore, access and thus bioremediation can be limited by the rates at which the chemical dissolves into the water or desorbs from the soil. The third point that's important to bioremediation is the uh, availability of either an electron acceptor or an electron donor. For an organism that is oxidizing a particular chemical, they must have an electron acceptor. Usually that's oxygen. That's what you and most organisms uh, use as electron acceptor for metabolism. With regard to electron donor, these are used by organisms that require reducing power to metabolize uh, particular chemicals. For example, dechlorination reactions often benefit from additional electron donor. And if one is dealing with these kinds of reactions, then additions of electron donors uh, can stimulate bioremediation. This means that certain chemicals can only be broken down in certain environments that provide the appropriate electron acceptor or donor for the organism. For example, Specific chemicals can only be broken down under aerobic or high oxygen conditions, while others may be degraded only under anaerobic or low oxygen conditions. The fourth point that's important to successful bioremediation is that the environment must be habitable for organisms. In other words, not too toxic for successful growth of those organisms. Factors such as solvents or heavy metals can be components that make the environment uh, unacceptable for living organisms. If a site is contaminated with materials that are toxic to microorganisms, it then becomes necessary to either eliminate the toxicity or use a cleanup method other than bioremediation. In summary then, to achieve successful bioremediation, one needs to know which, if any, of these four uh, factors are limiting bioremediation and then uh, address those. For example, if the number of organisms uh, are limiting bioremediation, then one can attempt to add organisms. If the accessibility of the chemical is limiting bioremediation, one can attempt to use detergents uh, to enhance the availability. Or if the electron acceptor or donor are insufficient for bioremediation, then one can add those components. And this latter addition is usually uh, the most easy to achieve. The fourth point which is on the habitability of the environment. If the environment is too toxic, then it's often not possible to resolve that problem and other means of remediation may be necessary. Biodegradation frequently occurs naturally without human intervention. However, in many of these cases, the rates of degradation are unacceptably slow. To speed up bioremediation or to initiate it where it is not naturally occurring, the environment of the contaminated site must be modified or enhanced. Site characteristics play a critical role in deciding whether bioremediation is even possible. During the process of determining whether bioremediation is feasible at a site, we need to ascertain first whether the contaminant is degradable, 
Second, the physical nature and extent of the contamination. And third, what factors limit degradation at a particular site? In some cases, contaminant degradability can be determined by reviewing the published scientific literature. In other cases, field and laboratory testing may be necessary. A lot of researchers in laboratories throughout the country, and in fact throughout the world, do research on the biodegradability of certain compounds. In other words, how easy it is to degrade trichloroethylene or benzene or 1,4-dioxane. So that there are examples throughout the scientific literature, there's research going on continually now, showing that certain compounds, in fact most compounds, are degradable under certain conditions by microorganisms in the laboratory. The physical nature and extent of the contamination at the site can be determined through an analysis of water and soil samples. This process is commonly referred to as site characterization. You need to know the vertical and horizontal extent of the contaminant plume to de properly design a cleanup system that will capture and clean up your problem. There's many methods that you can use for defining contaminant plumes. The method we most frequently use is an auger rig with hollow stem augers, either with a split spoon sampler or with a screened lead section. We collect soil and water samples vertically throughout the soil formation and into groundwater. By collecting samples for analyses, we can determine where the problem is. The extent of contamination determines the type of cleanup that is necessary. A critical question to be answered in this analysis is whether the chemical has reached the water table. If the contamination has moved down through the soil and reached the water table, the chemical's density and water solubility, as well as the structure of the aquifer, determine whether the contamination has spread across the top of the water table, mixed into the groundwater, or continue to travel deeper into the aquifer. Chemicals that do not readily dissolve into water will exist largely as non-aqueous phase liquids, or NAPLs. NAPLs can exist both above and below the water table. Identifying whether NAPLs are present is important since any NAPL represents a long-term source of a dissolved contaminant. Every effort must be made to physically remove as much of this material as possible. If you've determined you have both a soil and groundwater problem, the first thing you need to do is to make sure that you have no non-aqueous phase liquids or NAPLs in the groundwater. There's a big difference between dissolved contamination and product. If you have product, you need to add one more step into your cleanup with a product recovery system to remove that free product, which will continue to dissolve and act as a continuing long-term source. Following product recovery, a quantity of NAPL generally remains trapped in the soil and dissolved contaminants remain in the groundwater. In situ bioremediation has the greatest potential to address the dissolved residuals. The NAPL trapped above the water table normally needs to be removed by other technologies such as soil vapor extraction. Finally, we need to evaluate which of the biodegradation requirements are not present at the site. In simple terms, bioremediation involves manipulating conditions so that all four biodegradation requirements are met. This is accomplished by bringing together contaminants, organisms, and electron acceptors or donors into close physical contact with each other. The first factor to be considered is the soil. Identifying the type of soil at the site is critical to designing a bioremediation system that will be effective. The ease with which chemicals or organisms can move through the soil structure is overwhelmingly important. Soil conditions are important for effective bioremediation. The most important condition is that the ability of water to move through that soil to allow uh, substrates to get to organisms, to allow products to move away from organisms. 
bioremediation has been most successful in sandy soils, where the contaminants, organisms, and electron acceptors or donors are relatively mobile and can come into contact easily. Clays and other low permeability soils are more problematic. It is difficult to move water through these soils, and the ability to biodegrade and trap contaminants is limited. The, the soil type controls a lot of the technology that's not related to the microorganism. In other words, in a very clay subsurface, it's difficult to pump liquids in. It'd be difficult to pump liquids through for above ground treatment also. But as a result, it's difficult maybe to get nutrients into the system. A good rule of thumb is that bioremediation is limited to soils with a conductivity of 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per second or greater. The factor which most frequently limits degradation of some common contaminants is the presence of an electron acceptor. Therefore, by far the most common approach to in-situ bioremediation is to add an electron acceptor. For example, many of the aromatic petroleum hydrocarbons are degraded rapidly under aerobic conditions. However, oxygen availability is limited in many of the groundwater environments where petroleum is spilled. Organisms naturally present in soil environments are capable of degrading these compounds and will do so if given a source of oxygen. It should be kept in mind, however, that supplying oxygen is only useful if the organisms present can use oxygen as an electron acceptor. Other approaches have been tried for chemicals which are degraded by organisms under different electron acceptor or donor conditions. For example, nitrate can be supplied if denitrifying organisms that can degrade the chemical are present. If biodegradation is limited by the absence of a sufficient quantity of appropriate organisms, then adding microorganisms may be a viable alternative. Two issues must be considered here, the rate of the biodegradation reaction and the number of organisms present that can carry out the reaction. By growing microorganisms under near optimal conditions on the surface, and injecting them into the contaminated zone, we may be able to increase the number of organisms that have a sufficiently fast reaction pathway. Of course, this only works if the organisms can survive in the soil environment, be efficiently transported to contaminated regions, and an appropriate electron acceptor or donor is available. It needs to be acknowledged that the scientific community is only at the threshold of fully understanding the survival and transport issues of microorganisms in groundwater environments. Attempts to introduce microorganisms at actual field sites have produced inconclusive results. If suitable organisms are present naturally, but not in sufficient quantities, an alternative to adding organisms may be to encourage the growth of the natural population. This will occur whenever biodegradation is stimulated, for example, by adding oxygen. Since new cells are also produced by this process, the population will grow. Degradation rates may also be limited by the extent to which the microorganisms have access to the chemical. If the contaminant exists as a napple, that is, as a separate phase rather than dissolved in water, or if it is absorbed onto soil particles, then the contaminant must first move into solution through the processes of diffusion, desorption, and dissolution. The rates of these processes can be slow enough to limit the overall rates of degradation. Approaches such as the addition of surfactants have been considered to address this class of limitations, but most of this work is still at the research stage. Again, the keys to evaluating whether bioremediation is feasible at a site are whether the contaminant is degradable, the physical nature and extent of the contamination, and what factors limit degradation at the site. Bioremediation then involves bringing contaminants, organisms, and an electron acceptor or donor together. This can be done in three ways. Adding oxygen or another electron acceptor or donor, adding microorganisms or stimulating the naturally occurring organisms, and promoting contaminant dissolution and desorption. Research scientists and other experts are learning more and more about the effectiveness of these factors and conditions, both in the laboratory and the field. 
As in-situ bioremediation is increasingly considered for use in the field, many issues arise which need examining, such as, what about degradation products? Aren't other chemicals produced when organisms break down pollutants? To answer these questions, we must understand that a given organism will use one chemical as food and produce another chemical as waste. Say for example that some organism degrades a compound to a more hazardous compound in the laboratory, then you might suspect that that's not a good technology to use. But there might be another organism that takes that more hazardous compound in the, in the subsurface and transforms it into a completely harmless product. One of the products of successful bioremediation is growth of bacteria. And the question might be asked, are these bacteria a potential uh, environmental hazard? And the answer is almost always no, because these bacteria uh, are most commonly environmental organisms in any case. The only thing that's happened is they've grown to slightly higher numbers as a result of the effective bioremediation. But those organisms, once the substrate is gone, will return to their original population densities uh, and cause uh, no problem in the environment. Sites contaminated with multiple organic chemicals are particularly challenging for bioremediation. So if you have a compound like benzene that is aerobically degradable and a compound like tetrachloroethylene, which can be degraded anaerobically, then the treatment technology you apply to that site has to incorporate both systems in a way that you degrade both contaminants. And this kind of application is, is really just starting now, where the, the attempt to bioremediate sites with complex mixtures of contaminants is using the knowledge of laboratory studies in unique ways. With regard to the degradation of PCE and TCE, we have an interesting situation because the only biodegradation of PCE that has been demonstrated occurs under anaerobic conditions, which means the absence of oxygen. The degradation of TCE can also occur under anaerobic condition, but occurs more rapidly under aerobic conditions. So to treat both PCE and TCE in contaminated situation. One requires both anaerobic and aerobic conditions. Uh, while at the, the research stage this can be demonstrated, it's more difficult to pull off the combination of these uh, two types of treatments in the field. Uh, the, the big question and the, one of the biggest problems that we see, in, especially in an area like this where you have used, where we've used, the citizens have used leaded gasoline for years is we have concentrations of lead in the tens to hundreds of parts per million, far above our risk-based uh, numbers, uh, endemic, if you will, throughout an, an urban area. Uh, will uh, uh, there be a time when we have biological treatment of those materials? Uh, how will that work? You know, where can it be applied? Toxic metals can be important in bioremediation because they can limit the effectiveness of bioremediation because they're toxic to the organism. If the concentration is too high, uh, however, if the concentration is low enough, the bioremediation can occur uh, of the organic chemical, but one should not expect that the heavy metal to be transformed or remediated in any way. We would like to know, is there an application for, in Saginaw Bay, Kalamazoo River, places like that where we have PCBs uh, that uh, right now we're looking at digging a lot of stuff up and taking it to the dump. Where are we? When are we going to be able to see something like that uh, applied to the field? This summer, next summer, before I retire? <laughs> what we've learned with chlorinated solvents and heavily chlorinated compounds like uh, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs is that under anaerobic conditions, we can dechlorinate these compounds. The dechlorinated products are more amenable to aerobic degradation than the heavily chlorinated compounds. A good example of this would be with something such as PCBs. We have river sediment in our lab, for example, in which we're trying to apply bioremediation technology to the river sediment to see if we can degrade PCBs. So we're right on the cusp of having some very successful bioremediation technologies and some which are in the process of being designed. The first thing that anybody has to realize in Michigan is that we have just a tremendously complex series of soils. We would really like to know uh, when and where is bioremediation most effective? Is it a sandy loam? Is it a sand? Is it a sandy gravel? 
uh, will it work in clay? Uh, how far down uh, will the stuff work in the soils? Is there a limit? Our experience has taught us that there is at least one class of problems that can be readily addressed by bioremediation. This is contamination of groundwater and sandy soils by petroleum products. This approach has proven successful at a number of sites around the country. Perhaps the fundamental question on the minds of those responsible for cleaning up contaminated sites is, how does bioremediation compare to other technologies? Before you can determine if bioremediation would be a feasible treatment, you need to, one, define your problem area. Once you've defined your problem area, you need to weigh the benefits and the costs associated with bioremediation versus the other methods that are available. Quite frequently, to properly clean a site up, you will combine several technologies together. Two primary advantages of using in situ bioremediation are liability and cost. Traditional remediation efforts such as excavation and reburial of soil simply transfer the contaminants from one site to another. There is also potential for future liability if the second site eventually leaks. Since biodegradation actually destroys the contaminants, this type of liability is eliminated. Uh, the promise that uh, bioremediation brings is, is that, number one, we don't have to take stuff to a dump or licensed sanitary landfill, if you will, where we become PRPs 10 or 15 down, years down the road again. So we're reducing the volume of material going to a landfill, but we are also, uh, in, in certain circumstances, looking like we're going to be able to get the uh, cleanup done where the uh, site's clean. Moreover, while bioremediation is not an inexpensive technology, it is often considerably cheaper than excavation, transportation, and reburial. That's the thing that responsible parties should be considering. Let's stop looking two years down the road or five years down the road. Let's look 20. Uh, the nice thing about bioremediation is, at least from the laboratory, and the initial results that we've seen is, is that you're looking at a much shorter term cleanup you're looking at three years or five years instead of 10 or 15 or 20. It is important to understand that at this time, the use of in situ bioremediation does pose a level of uncertainty. It is a new technology, and as such, we are not always able to accurately predict how successful it will be, how long it will take, or how much it will cost. Given this, it is not unreasonable to wonder whether in situ bioremediation is really practical today, are there any success stories, or are we really still at the research stage? Bioremediation is being used quite often for petroleum hydrocarbons around the country and throughout the world because that's been a fairly effective, reasonable application. In Europe, for example, people had a uh, football field size contaminant plume in which they used oxygen and nitrate as another electron acceptor and degraded the contaminants such that they no longer saw it in their monitoring wells at the detection level of their analytical capability. Nationally, there are hundreds of contamination sites where bioremediation is either being considered, is currently in use, or where it has been used successfully in the cleanup. Most of these sites involved either petroleum, wood preserving, or solvent contamination. Bioremediation has also been effectively used for many different types of surface soil contamination. In surface soil conditions, it is much easier to establish a large microbial population and to ensure an adequate supply of oxygen. Throughout the course of this videotape program, we have explored many of the key issues related to in situ bioremediation and its application. We have discussed the basic concepts behind bioremediation and the four components necessary for its effectiveness. We have examined how site characteristics impact this effectiveness and what scientific evaluations are necessary for assessing the feasibility of bioremediation. And we have looked at the current state-of-the-art technology, examined issues, noted successes, and identified active research areas. But perhaps most importantly, we have offered for consideration the tremendous potential of in-situ bioremediation as a viable cleanup technology. 
in situ bioremediation is today an area of ongoing research. Promising results are emerging from our laboratories on a regular basis. We expect these results will improve our understanding of the processes involved in bioremediation technology. This improved understanding will undoubtedly lead to designing new approaches where bioremediation is either currently not in use or is not now cost effective. If asked about the future of bioremediation, I would say that it's an infant technology in terms of its demonstration in the field. It's a more advanced technology if one considers the advances in the laboratory. One of uh, the exciting aspects of bioremediation these days is that we're using this new understanding of which chemicals are degraded under what conditions to develop new technologies. It may sound like bioremediation as itself is a new technology, but as I've described, in some sort or the other, it's been used for decades. To get bioremediation off the ground, because there are so many doubts in some of us old people's mind, if you will, is, is that we're going to have to go from the laboratory in a relatively quick time frame, this year or next, and apply this stuff to the field. The state's going to have to take some risk that they may not get the level of cleanup at every site that they think that they should get. Uh, the universities may have to move before they've tied down every, every I and they, they've, they've crossed every T and, and everything is perfect and industry is going to have to risk some money to do that. I feel that bioremediation in the 90s is going to become the more desired cleanup technology. I think on existing sites right now that bioremediation will be added to speed up the recovery and on new sites that possibly with the combination of other technologies, but bioremediation will become the main desired treatment technology. Bioremediation, an age-old process coming of age as a technology for the future.